We've got four speakers today who are going to talk about each of the four nations of the UK and Ireland. Um, the first of these um, is um, Professor Aidan O'Sullivan, uh, who is a professor of archaeology at University College Dublin. He lectures in early medieval archaeology of Ireland and Northwest Europe. He was co-principal investigator of the early medieval archaeology project, EMAP, which was funded by the Irish Council's INSTAR program. And he's also director of the UCD Centre for Experimental Archaeology and Material Culture, which is currently investigating, amongst other things, early medieval technologies and material culture. So I hope we're now ready for Aidan to be able to come up and uh, give his talk. Um, Aidan, thank you very much for agreeing to speak today and starting us off. Uh, the floor is all yours. OK, so you can see my opening slide there, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I certainly can. OK, so uh, uh, thank you very much to the MSRG for asking me to speak and thank you to Carenza for introducing me. Um, uh, and so I'll clip on. I'll start my uh, my my timekeeping so that I keep it to 25 minutes. So what have we learned about early medieval settlement archaeology in Ireland in both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland from large infrastructural developments? And this will be uh, our insights from the Early Medieval Archaeology Project, or EMAP, uh, that we uh, carried out here in Ireland. So uh, what I will do in this lecture, will explore firstly what was the impact of infrastructural development on our knowledge of early medieval archaeology in Ireland. I will talk about what did the Early Medieval Archaeology Project, or EMAP, do to investigate and widen understanding of this data. And then I will highlight just a few things, population and demographics, settlement, agricultural economy uh, that we have learned about early medieval Ireland from the major developments. Um, and very finally, then, uh, what might we do next? So as a background, even prior to the Celtic Tiger e economic boom uh, in Ireland from about 1995 to about 2007, 2008, we knew that the archaeology of settlement in early medieval Ireland, uh, 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 from early medieval Ireland, AD 400 to 1100, was already one of the richest archaeological landscapes in Europe and, and uh, possibly the world. We probably have over 55,000 known early medieval settlement sites, uh, at least 47,000 ring forts, uh, rats, dunes and cashels. We have 2,000 cranogs or island dwellings and lakes. We have 5,500 early medieval church sites and we have thousands of burial sites, and these are only the ones that we, we know of. Uh, early medieval settlement archaeology in Ireland comprises about, um, pushing on for about 40% of all known archaeological sites on this island. So it's just uh, astonishingly uh, rich. We could all go to Dublin uh, if we could travel, get into a bus, drive to sort of some random part of the Irish landscape, pull up outside some farmer's house and say, is there a ring fort or a rat or a fairy fort on your land, and he would say, yeah, out the back here, you can go and have a look at it. Um, it there's very few places in the world where you could actually just, you know, randomly uh, go to a, a random place and visit an early medieval settlement site. Um, now, er, Ireland's early medieval archaeology in particular benefits from the Celtic tiger boom. The richness of the, that early medieval settlement landscape meant that it was everywhere. Uh, when these major infrastructural developments were going on. Massive investments in motorways and road improvements, especially in the Republic of Ireland uh, from EU funding uh, in those years. And the requirement to mitigate the destruction of archaeological sites uh, um, uh, uh, meant that, that uh, uh, after the EU Valletta Convention, meant that uh, 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 all sites had to be excavated. There was no sampling. 100% of archaeological sites discovered in motorway schemes are excavated in total, um, uh, 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 <coughs> which meant that what we actually had in those years was the development of long term excavations for the first time in Ireland, excavations which went on for a couple of years uh, with cohorts or, or teams of archaeologists uh, up to 100 uh, on some sites. Uh, working continuously for month on end. And what happened then was we created a whole new cohort of highly experienced professional archaeologists who are adept at archaeological excavation techniques and skills, uh, which created a canon, uh, a new canon of scholarship. And particularly important was the work of the what was then called the National Roads Authority, uh, which has now become the Transport Infrastructure Ireland. Um, and they have provided uh, uh, amazing leadership 
in the in the publication and the analysis of all of these excavations. Infrastructural development in Northern Ireland was also ongoing, perhaps not at the same scale, because the uh, motorway network and road network in Northern Ireland was already pretty advanced, was, you know, by the early 1990s, was certainly better than uh, that found in the Republic. But you do get infrastructural schemes like this one here, which is the Enniskillen Bypass, which led to spectacular discoveries like this one, the Drum Clay Cranog excavation. The Celtic Tiger created an exponential increase in excavations of early medieval sites, especially visible in the years 1998 to 2007. And in this graph on the left hand side, you can see the, a histogram showing the increase in the actual number of excavations that suddenly exploded in the late 1990s and into 2000s, uh, you know, going from, say, 241 excavations a year or uh, sorry, a decade in the 1980s to uh, well over 2000. Uh, uh, in the, the 2000s. And then these are only early medieval sites. Don't forget now that all other chronological periods experience similar booms uh, in, in knowledge. So you were looking at about three and a half thousand archaeological excavations of early medieval sites. In recent years, uh, since about 2016, as, as the Irish economy has recovered, we've seen major infrastructural development has seen renewed activity. Um, and we've seen, a, for example, in, an increase in excavation licenses in the Republic from 611 in 2013 to 1,269 in 2019. So Irish archaeology is starting to uh, gear up for major new discoveries again. Um, most of these previous Celtic Tiger Boom infrastructural archaeological discoveries have now been published by Transport Infrastructure Ireland. Uh, their grey literature are available on the Digital Repository of Ireland, uh, which is free to download. And they also have published many of their, uh, their scheme monographs. These are uh, monographs that follow the track of individual motorway developments. And these uh, have been published as monographs, but they're also available online uh, uh, through uh, the Digital Repository of Ireland. And this has created large scale data, which has now uh, enabled Irish archaeologists to do very different types of analysis that wouldn't have been done before. So, for example, we have at least 3000 radiocarbon dates for the early period in Ireland, um, and that's probably uh, the largest data set of radiocarbon dates for any particular chronological period in the world. <clears throat> the Transport Infrastructure Ireland Digital Heritage Collection is freely available. All those excavation reports are available to download, geophysical reports, all the books, audio books, videos, uh, and other resources are available through uh, DRI.ie. <clears throat> so we established the, uh, the Early Medieval Archaeology Project in 2007 with funding from the Irish National Strategic Archaeological Research Programme, which was a, a major research funded programme uh, in, the, in, the, in the 2000s. And our uh, mission our, uh, in EMAP was to investigate the character of early medieval excavations in Ireland, to publish reports and books, to establish a website and to promote collaboration <laughs> sectors. And we moved very fast. We took the attitude that the best was the enemy of the good. So what we used to do is every year we would uh, publish online a report. Uh, um, and these would be pretty substantial reports on, say, 250, 300 uh, of the best early medieval excavations that we could find. Um, we, we started off looking at early medieval settlements and dwellings. That was subsequently published then as a British archaeological report, a BAR, uh, um, which makes available, for example, in settlements, uh, all of the features, the descriptions of the sites, the site plans, the radiocarbon dates, the uh, uh, analyses and so on of 241 key early medieval sites. We published another one uh, on early medieval agriculture, livestock and cereal production, which was also published as a British archaeological report in 2014. And that, again, gives you uh, uh, individual sections, not only interpretive chapters on farming landscapes and tools and corn drying kilns and so on, and but also uh, uh, breakthrough analyses of plant remains from about 350 early medieval sites and of faunal remains by uh, Dr. Tom Kerr, uh, Dr. Mariel McClatchy did the plant remains analysis. So these are all resources now that are available to archaeologists to go straight to to try and uh, um, synthesize and understand what actually happened uh, in early medieval Ireland. We also published a report on crafts and production, which again was published as a British archaeological report in 2015. So the online report is available to download free, or you can buy the, the BAR our reports. And finally, we published an online report in the early medieval economy, 
And all of those reports are available on the UCD Library Research Repository that you can download uh, for free. You can just go to the UCD Library Research Repository and download all of those reports, and, and very substantial they are too. Um, so, moving on from that, um, what did uh, 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 some things that we might actually think about? Okay, so Irish archaeologists were then faced with enormous quantities of new data about the early medieval period and about every other period, in actual fact. The Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, medieval and post-medieval periods have all been transformed uh, uh, by these, uh, these, these very large data sets. But let's focus on the early medieval period. Some of the, some of the questions that, that we'll ask will focus on what do we know now about population? What do we know now about early medieval settlement? What do we know about early medieval agriculture? So, for example, let's start with population demographics and change. How many people were there in early medieval Ireland? Well, it's really difficult to estimate something like that. If you know, if we accept that there's something like 60,000 ring forts in Ireland from the 6th and the 7th centuries AD, and that maybe half of them were occupied at one time, and that each ring fort was home to an extended family group of maybe eight to ten people, then you can make an estimate of about 240,000 people. Other estimates have also been suggested from wider ranges of data that you could have been looking at a population of uh, one million people in Ireland. The interesting thing about if you look at this distribution map there on the right hand side, <clears throat> or if you look at it in a more local sense, the numbers of ring forts in parts of the rural landscape are more or less the same as the number of uh, modern Irish farms. Um, so you could, could say that the modern rural Irish population, if you take away towns and cities, is, is probably something equivalent to, uh, uh, um, uh, to what it might have been in the past. Um, Emma Hanna and Rowan McLaughlin have estimated that you could have been looking at about 3 million people living in Ireland at around AD uh, 700. But this lower left-hand uh, image here shows the, the potential of the large-scale uh, radiocarbon data analysis that is now possible. And these are, I won't go into this in too much detail, but these are our curves showing the densities of radiocarbon dates by decade uh, across time. And you can see, if you look, for example, at the blue line here, it shows a rise in the density or the, the actual number of radiocarbon dates uh, uh, um, and then a decline after about 700 uh, AD, uh, a steady decline in the centuries afterwards. And that's similarly replicated in the number and density of radiocarbon dates for burials, uh, um, for other uh, uh, um, uh, archaeological features such as plant remains, uh, bones, uh, and other things. So there is there is a, a striking sense that the Irish population boomed in the 5th and 6th century up to around uh, 700 AD and then went to, into a long steady decline in the centuries afterwards. And that could explain some of the enigmas uh, that we, we, we can see in the archaeological records such as the, the uh, gradual abandonment of ring forts and, uh, uh, um, and the, the, the general rarity uh, of archaeological sites that date to the 10th and the 11th century. How did these people live together in the 6th and the 7th century? The peoples of early medieval Ireland, uh, unlike elsewhere in early medieval Northwest Europe, and I put a question mark there because that's open to question, uh, overwhelmingly lived in settlement enclosures. Everybody lived inside them, from nobility to clerics to free commoners to the lowest social grades in early Irish society. The, the major infrastructural developments have shown that there is no great hidden settlement record of the poor or the landless, uh, i.e. there are no unenclosed settlements out there in, in the landscape. And here's examples of early medieval ring forts that you can see here at County Roscommon, a particularly striking example here of tree located beside each other. And you have to imagine everybody as inhabiting these settlement enclosures. Um, these settlement enclosures we know now certainly do vary in form. So, for example, one of the things that we discovered uh, in the last decade was the, was the existence of what we now call the early medieval settlement cemeteries. These are places where people are living, but there are burial grounds right beside them. Um, so there isn't a distinction between a settlement area and a burial area. These are, these are spaces which are enclosed, uh, which are uh, uh, zones of activity for habitation and agriculture and economic activity, but also for burial uh, um, presumably of your ancestors and, and of your kin group. Um, all of these early medieval closures are basically the same in terms of their date and their material culture, uh, uh, um, and it, it really seems to be about practice. And even where sites appear to be unenclosed, and this is an amusing one, this, I used to talk about Ballynacarriga, 
here in County Cork, where I used to talk about uh, the, uh, these, these buildings, these houses, that they're in an unenclosed settlement, as long as you ignore the fact there actually is an enclosure around them. Um, so they actually they are enclosed settlements. Um, so even our ones that we thought were unenclosed have enclosures around them as well. Um, everybody in the church is living inside an enclosure. Uh, these settlement uh, enclosures of the church obviously varied. The church was politically and economically very significant. It was a center of population, uh, agriculture and inv uh, investment and land ownership. And there are debates in Irish archaeology about the role of, of uh, some of these monastic centres in the uh, an emerging market economy after about AD 800. But we generally think now that very few of these would have been monastic towns uh, 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 or, or uh, you know, centres of uh, large population. Uh, villages at the very most, and very few of them in the actual fact. Uh, there's a certainly an amount of diversity. You get sites like this, there's a Clon McNeyes in County Offaly, and excavations here have revealed industrial activity at the edge of the sacred zone uh, and zoo archaeological activity indicating some measure of provisioning of, for a potentially large population in the monastery. Uh, uh, it's similar in patterns to what was happening in uh, Highburn or North Dublin. Um, but on the other hand, uh, infrastructural development that clipped the edges of early medieval uh, church enclosures. Typically, uh, 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 motorways avoided churches because they, they exist in the landscape today. So the road engineers and the archaeologists would usually plan to uh, to go around these sites, obviously to minimise the, 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 uh, the destruction of archaeological features, but also to minimise the costs uh, uh, of, of, of doing archaeological excavations. But uh, this is an example of Clon Fad in County Westmead. That's a, a church over there, surrounded by a sacred enclosure. But you can see an enclosure boundary there, there, and an enclosure boundary there, and that would stretch into a massive enclosure about 300 metres across. Um, but the excavations here show that there's very little uh, evidence of actual habitation. We're probably looking at these are spaces actually for animals and agriculture rather than for human uh, habitation. Um, all of these infrastructural developments then have, have provided us with very large numbers of uh, radiocarbon dates, as I've already seen, and we can start to model patterns of activity where uh, uh, everything seems to kick off around the 550s, uh, um, the 560s, in the decades after the Justinian plague. One of the things we think might be happening is the Justinian plague hits Ireland hard in the 540s. Uh, there's a complete severing uh, from the uh, uh, previous socio-cultural and political systems. Um, and then the Irish population starts to boom again, starts to grow, uh, growing rapidly up to around 700 AD and thereafter declining. And you can see that these graphs essentially show that picture of lots of things happening in the 6th century and the 7th century and then a gradual decline thereafter. So one of the things that we would note as readers of early medieval uh, archaeology in, uh, in, uh, in Britain, but also in Northwest Europe, are patterns of agricultural and economic change. Uh, and one of the principal ones that, that, that I'd be familiar with would be the idea of an increasing focus on crop cultivation, cereal cultivation, uh, for various socio-economic reasons. Um, so when we actually started to look at the agricultural evidence uh, as part of the early medieval archaeology project, as EMAP, uh, we basically uh, arrived at, at that, with that, a similar model of, of changing patterns of agricultural organization. Certainly, the, by the early 6th and the 7th century, we have a very sophisticated agricultural economy, which is presumably supporting this uh, population growth, and very clear zoo archaeological and paleo botanical evidence for significant increase in the scale and intensity of livestock management, uh, cattle, sheep and pigs, and co uh, crop cultivation. But simple models of change across the early medieval period uh, going from cattle pastoralism to crop cultivation do not hold in Ireland. Irish agriculture does not fit easily with Northwest European trends of a shift to grain production. Um, we get actually sites like these. This is Raystown and County Mead. These seem to be centers of agricultural production. Again, what you get is, uh, is habitation, but uh, intense agricultural activity with multiple water mills and cereal drying kilns uh, um, and evidence for crop uh, processing. Um, and also burial. Um, and in this case, we, we wonder, is this potentially a production centre associated with a local church? Um, you do get early medieval settlements with small gardens around them, uh, and these also show evidence for internal change. So the waxing and waning fortunes 
of a household group or an extended uh, uh, kin group, giving them the ability to expand their enclosures and expand their activities, but also sometimes uh, for their, their uh, economic conditions to deteriorate uh, um, and for sites to be either go quieter or to be abandoned. Intriguingly too, these large scale uh, infrastructural developments have also given us a sense of that wider countryside. And while some early medieval rats had small cultivated gardens beside them, many didn't. And the early Irish landscape was largely open and unenclosed. Um, and it could have looked something like this in terms of this reconstruction image based on Cahar Coman in County Clare, where you do get settlement enclosures with their little gardens around them, but out there in the open countryside is uh, are areas where uh, cattle can be herded, presumably by, by boys and girls. Um, and you might get occasional unenclosed settlements out there, but generally uh, the intense focus is on these unsettlement enclosures. Dairying was key, but it remained a key aspect of early Irish farming across uh, this period. Uh, 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 cattle herds were managed to maximise the presence of female cows, who could provide uh, uh, you with calves, but more importantly, provide you with milk. So that as the as the cows are feeding their calves, and you intervene between the calves and the cows to basically take the milk or take a proportion of, of the milk. The cattle uh, are are important in all kinds of ways in terms of social status, but also in terms of symbolism, uh, and also in terms of economic wealth, which is involved in terms of lordship and clientship and the economic systems and and uh, networks and relationships that knitted this society together. But our analysis have five minutes to go. Five minutes, yeah, I got that. Uh, our analysis shows that uh, I have always have fun with this this particular graph with what with my undergraduates, and I say so. We know that early Irish farming shifted from cattle herding uh, um, towards perhaps other forms of livestock such as sheep or pig as you go across the early medieval period. So you can see the major change: cattle here are in the black, sheep uh, um, are in the red, and pigs are in the in the blue. And I say to my students, look at the enormous change. As you go from the 5th century to the 6th century to the 7th century to the 8th century to the 9th century to the 10th century to the 11th century and they look at me and they go but it isn't changing and i say yep yeah, it isn't is it um but there are regional patterns there seems to be some parts of the country where there there are some shifts in that we also see the importance of crops now Paleontological, plant, macrofossil, and archaeological evidence suggest the importance of, of, uh, of oats and barley, but some growth of wheat and rye. Um, and this is something that seems to start in the third century. Um, and we have a profusion of early medieval horizontal water mills, and particularly of cereal drying kilns that indicate the substantial processing of these crops. Um, and there is also little change in that, too. If anything, what we probably see is a diversification as you move through the period with more types of crops being grown uh, and the presence of, 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 of peas and, and legumes and so on. Uh, but generally, oats and barley dominated the Irish uh, um, uh, economic pattern. Very, very finally, what's going on in terms of burial, uh, burial practice? Uh, the early medieval uh, Irish are burying their dead as, uh, in, in inhumed burial, supine, west, east orientation, similar to late Roman Britain, not necessarily Christian right. And we're also beginning to see evidence for potential early medieval cremation burials. Um, and there are some patterns and shifts, but actually it's actually quite messy. Uh, and the archaeological evidence has given us now the ability to look at all kinds of new questions, and particularly with bioarchaeological studies, isotopic and biogeochemical and demographic analysis. Um, so, for example, see the mapping debt project to see that in more detail. Uh, what do we want to do now? We want to, we're thinking of, of moving towards a project called Early Medieval People and Things, or MPAT, uh, investigating material culture, because we have now a vast collection or assemblage of early medieval objects uh, which have barely been looked at uh, from these, these periods, which may well be able to give us all kinds of interesting uh, uh, questions to answer about the nature of the society and how people made their own worlds through material culture. I'll finish up here by uh, acknowledging uh, the support of the Heritage Council, it's uh, Irish National Strategic Archaeological Research Programme, uh, um, which funded the EMAP project, and also thanks to our EMAP colleagues and all the Irish archaeologists who helped us along the way, and particularly thank uh, uh, all the site directors and the archaeologists from the NRA and the Transport Infrastructure Ireland, the National Museum of Ireland, the National Monument Service, and our colleagues in other universities. Um, it was said at the time where, uh, when we were finishing up the EMAP uh, white book, as we call it, after the albums, or sorry, after the Beatles album, the White Album. Um, when we were finishing this up, our acknowledgements page was five pages long. 
uh, EMAP became a black hole sucking in everybody in Irish archaeology. And the early medieval Ireland, uh, AD 400, 1100, the Evidence from Archaeological Excavations book is being reprinted as we speak. It's about to become available next week. And it has a 15 page bibliographical essay on all the publications on early medieval Ireland since 2014. So all these resources are available to you to utilize uh, in any ways that you want. Uh, all of those reports are available to download online. The Early Medieval Ireland book uh, is available to purchase from the Royal Irish Academy, Royal Irish Academy or, the, or, or anywhere from Amazon.com or, 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 or whatever. Um, so to conclude, um, we went through an extraordinary uh, boom uh, uh, of, of data creation, but, but data creation requires the creation of knowledge uh, and the communication of that knowledge. Um, and our task isn't done. Um, we still have much that we need to do. Um, and just as we start to get grips with this data, we now see that uh, uh, Irish archaeology is, is beginning to boom again. Uh, uh, and we're going to be faced with, uh, you know, even in the, the six years since we published the EMAP book, uh, multiple new early medieval sites have become available for analysis. So that's what we hope to be doing in, in the future. So thank you very much. And I, I'll leave it at that.